It was the early hours of January 4, 2015, in the province of Santa Elena, Ecuador. The area was enveloped in silence as all residents were resting after several days of New Year celebrations. The only disruption was a couple arguing inside their car parked along kilometer 2.5 on the San Pablo Road, part of the Spondylus route. Amid the shouts, the woman phoned a close friend, who was also a doctor, desperately seeking help as her husband was behaving erratically. She also implored him to look after her young son. Almost an hour later, an ambulance arrived at the scene. The 38-year-old woman had been fatally struck by a vehicle. Her husband claimed it was a hit and run, but inconsistencies in his statement raised suspicions. The only certainty the medical team had was the tragic loss of one of the country's most beloved singers. Edith Rosario Bermeo Kisneros was born on March 28, 1974, in Guayaquil, Ecuador, to parents Homero and Edith. She grew up alongside her siblings Danny and Fernando in a humble neighborhood in Duran. Despite her family's financial struggles from a young age, she was known for her cheerful and outgoing personality. Her love for music prompted her parents to enroll her in singing classes, which paid off when she won a school festival at the age of eight. She also had a deep passion for television and movies. Initially nicknamed Charo or Charito, she later adopted the moniker Sharon, inspired by her admiration for actress Sharon Stone. After high school, Sharon pursued a degree in communication sciences at the Faculty of Social Communication at the State University of Guayaquil. She juggled various jobs, from teaching assistant to selling Morocco, a sweet Andean drink. During this time, she began singing with the band Los Hechiceros, which gave her the stage name Sharon La Hechichera. In 1995, she married Eduardo Gray, the band's founder, and they named their daughter Samantha after the lead character of Sharon's favorite TV series, Bewitched. Although her life was fulfilling, Sharon aspired for more. She dreamed of becoming a renowned solo artist and had been saving to make this a reality. Despite lacking family support and facing societal barriers due to her background, she remained undeterred. In 1998, Sharon used her savings to record her debut album, Corazon Valiente. This marked the beginning of her rise to fame, establishing her as a pioneer of the techno-cumbia genre and setting trends with her distinctive style of short skirts and tall boots. Over the years, Sharon focused on covering songs by well-known artists from Peru, Argentina and Mexico, making them popular in Ecuador. She proved herself not only as a talented singer, but also as a shrewd businesswoman. After separating from Eduardo in the mid-2000s, she concentrated on producing hits like Mi Confesión and Acariciame, and on achieving her breakthrough in television. In 2003, she wrote and starred in the telenovela La Hechicera on TC Televisión, which broke viewership records in Ecuador. She played Ziare de Fatima, a young woman aspiring to be a singer while trying to find a man who could free her from evil spells. The show was a massive success, catapulting Sharon to national fame and making her a household name across the country. The Universo newspaper named her one of the country's most beloved figures and Vistazo magazine listed her as one of the most desirable women. From then on, Sharon took on the roles of presenter on seven television programs, acted in five soap operas, and released nine albums. She also expanded her entrepreneurial ventures with her own lingerie collection and became the face of four calendars, which set sales records. At the pinnacle of her career and after years of solitude, Sharon decided it was time to find a stable partner again. In 2010, she met Giovanni Lopez, an Ecuadorian residing in New York. The attraction was immediate, and they not only started dating, but also began working together with him becoming the manager of La Hechichera. 
On May 30th and 31st, 2012, they welcomed their first child, whom they named Brian Giovanni. Although they appeared to be the perfect couple, rumors soon surfaced. Various media outlets reported that Giovanni was physically and verbally abusive towards Sharon. However, she preferred to remain silent on the matter. As the years passed, their relationship deteriorated further, leading up to the afternoon of January the 3rd, 2015. Sharon had been touring the country for end-of-year performances. She traveled with Giovanni and their two-year-old son to the cities of Ayangue and Olon, where they met with friends and enjoyed themselves. Later, a friend took Sharon to an apartment he had recently bought, Mentioning she was considering buying one for her elder daughter triggered Giovanni's wrath. He did not want Sharon spending her money in that way. Hours later, they went for coffee to meet with a music producer. Sharon needed to discuss royalties for some songs, which again upset Giovanni, feeling excluded from her financial decisions. The rest of the day, he spent drinking and arguing over everything. As night descended, Sharon and Giovanni started preparing to heed back home. At this juncture, their mutual friend, Dr. Roberto Bloom, offered to lead the way in his car, accompanying them on the journey. Officially, he claimed to want to be nearby in case of emergencies like a flat tire. But his true concern lay with Giovanni's level of inebriation. Eventually, they set off in their respective vehicles, Sharon taking the wheel of her car. During stops at service stations, Bloom observed the couple's arguments escalating. At one point, Sharon had to plead with Giovanni to cease drinking, emphasizing the distressing sight it was for their son, yet he adamantly refused. When they made another stop, the delay in getting back on the road was so long that Bloom approached to ask when they would continue. Sharon told him not to wait, and that they would leave after dinner. Bloom was somewhat worried, but she assured him everything would be fine. Tragically, it wasn't. In the early hours, as they were driving along kilometer 2.5 of the San Pablo Road on the Spondylus route in the province of Santa Elena, Sharon called Bloom in a panic, screaming for help because Giovanni was going crazy. She also asked him to look after Giovanito, her nickname for their son. That was the last time the doctor heard her voice. Minutes later, a 911 call was made. A woman reported seeing someone fall from a vehicle onto the road and then get run over by another. By era 1.15 a.m., Bloom arrived at the scene to find his friend, but what he encountered was horrific. Sharon lay on the ground, barely alive. Inside the car were her partner and her son. Almost an hour later, an ambulance and the police arrived at the scene. Giovanni told them that Sharon had stopped the car in the middle of the road to change their son's diaper, when another vehicle suddenly struck them and then sped away. The singer was rushed to Liborio Panchana Sotomayor Hospital. Despite the medical team's efforts, they were unable to save her. She died from multiple traumas, presumably caused by the traffic accident. She suffered from a skull fracture with internal bleeding, lung laceration, abrasions on her left shoulder and right arm, and a broken left leg. The news spread like wildfire, and various accounts of the incident quickly emerged. While many believed it was a horrific accident, others pointed fingers at Giovanni as the real culprit. He was detained for eight hours as a witness. Upon release, he faced the media cameras, defending himself by stating that the car was intact, that Sharon was the one driving, and that she had failed to notice another vehicle approaching at high speed. The vehicle they were traveling in, a wine-colored Suzuki, was confiscated after no bloodstains, dents, or fingerprints were found. It was later returned to its owner. That same day, a witness provided information about the vehicle that allegedly struck Sharon. The police managed to contact the owner, a woman named Tatiana Chavez. Upon inspecting her car, they noticed a dent on the front. She was quickly accused of causing the singer's death and taken into pre-trial detention. 
However, the prosecution had not yet ruled out the possibility that Giovanni was to blame. Around 10.30 a.m., Jose Serrano, the Minister of the Interior, posted on his Twitter account that, according to the latest police report, Sharon's death might have been a femicide rather than a traffic accident. By 8 p.m., Sharon's body had been transferred to Guayaquil for her wake, which was held at the Voltaire Paladines Polo Coliseum. By 11 a.m. that day, over 1,000 people attended, including fans and celebrities. Family members, such as her daughter Samantha and her ex-husband Eduardo, were also present. Her remains were moved to the Parque de la Paz Cemetery in Duran for Burial, where again over 1,000 individuals gathered. During the event, Minister Jose Serrano confirmed that a judge had issued pre-trial detention for Sharon's husband. There was still a long process ahead before the woman could rest in peace. On Monday, the 5th, the account of the sole eyewitness, the singer's son and Dr. Bloom, came to light. He told the prosecution that after the accident, he took the boy to the family's home where they had spent New Year's. There, the young boy began to recount what had happened, repeatedly saying that his father was bad and that he had pushed his mother. Subsequently, the boy was assessed by a psychological team from the prosecution. Nonetheless, Giovanni's lawyer opposed the idea of the young boy testifying against his father, yet there were still more witnesses against him. On January 8th, Samantha filed a private accusation against Giovanni at the prosecutor's office. The charge was for femicide, alleging that her mother's death was not the result of a traffic accident, but the culmination of a relationship in which the accused consistently abused the singer. She recounted that Sharon had attempted to separate from Giovanni, but was told that if she wanted to leave, she would have to pay him $50,000 for each year they were together. Terrified, Sharon was planning to escape to Spain with her children during a tour, which would provide the perfect opportunity. Just weeks before her death, she had filed a complaint for gender violence. Adding to this powerful statement were the autopsy results which revealed that Sharon had sustained injuries and bruises prior to the accident. It was also found that she was injured by the car's seatbelt, apparently in an attempt to defend herself from her partner's assaults. Furthermore, forensic analysis determined that Sharon was not driving the car from which she was thrown due to a blow resulting in her fall. She suffered skull fractures which left her in a coma before another vehicle struck her. This was compounded by the call she made minutes before her death and several testimonies from other close associates. Ultimately, Giovanni was formally charged with the manslaughter of Sharon and taken into pre-trial detention. However, there were still some unresolved mysteries as another suspect remained accused. On February 13th, young witnesses approached the police station to report that the car that had supposedly run over Sharon had actually hit them 45 minutes later. After examining the timeline, it was confirmed that the dent in Tatiana's car was caused by this incident. She was acquitted from the criminal proceedings and released. Investigators then worked to find the actual culprit of the accident. After reviewing 38 security camera tapes from the route, they identified a vehicle belonging to a man named Luis Miguel Correa Davila. Upon locating him, they inspected his vehicle, which had broken windows and replaced panes. The man decided to confess everything. He was the one driving the truck that crashed into Sharon. He was arrested for manslaughter. Nevertheless, Giovanni was still accused of pushing his partner out of the car. On June 30th, the Santa Elena judge, Oscar Guillén, sentenced him to two years of imprisonment for manslaughter. Sharon's family received this with sadness, feeling it was grossly inadequate for the severity of the crime committed and because they wanted the charge to be classified as femicide. On August 13th, 
the officials handling the case were suspended from their duties, the new judges of the Santa Elena Criminal Court issued a resolution nullifying everything processed in the case from the trial hearing onward and reclassified the charge to femicide. The main reason was the introduction of new evidence, such as text messages between Sharon and Giovanni, proving that he was extorting her not to leave him. While this was a relief for the victim's family, there was still the matter of exonerating Luis from the manslaughter charge as Samantha wanted her stepfather to face the full force of the law. On October 10th, a legal hearing took place concerning Luis. During this session, Jorge Torres, the prosecutor overseeing the case, declared that Luis had been driving at 61 km h, a speed that did not breach any legal duty of care. Torres further explained that although the breach was technically confirmed, the overall circumstances surrounding the incident were also taken into account. He provided a detailed description of the route Luis had followed, which, according to an expert report from the Office of Traffic Accident Investigations, showed that Luis had made a maneuver to avoid hitting Sharon as she unexpectedly crossed from the right to the left towards the median. Ultimately, Luis was found not guilty of manslaughter. Visibly emotional, he left the courthouse in tears, expressing to the media his relief at being vindicated after a long ordeal. Samantha, Sharon's daughter, hugged them both and stated in a later interview that the individual truly responsible for her mother's presence on the road had not yet been held accountable. On October 29th, a new hearing commenced in the first court of penal guarantees of Santa Elena. Evidence presented during this session confirmed that Giovanni had argued with Sharon because she wanted him to look after their son, which he refused. He then started to hit her and, following a struggle, pushed her onto the road, intending for a vehicle to run her over. It was also proven that the accused exhibited narcissistic traits with a propensity for violence. Giovanni was found guilty of the femicide against Sharon and sentenced to 26 years in prison. He was also ordered to pay a fine of 800 basic wages and $100,000 in compensation to the victim's family. The defense appealed the sentence to the appellate court. However, the prosecution argued that the evidence presented at the trial was procedurally valid. On January 6, 2016, the Provincial Court of Santa Elena upheld the court's verdict. Despite his proven guilt, Giovanni continued to claim his innocence, even alleging that feminist groups were using Sharon's case for political purposes. Amidst this, the singer's family still faced another painful trial. On the day of Sharon's death, photographs of her body in the Mogwe were shared across social networks. On March 14, 2016, Samantha, alongside the prosecutor Ana Luzuriaga, initiated a case for the invasion of privacy against two nurses at the Gregorio Panchana Hospital in the province of Santa Elena. Yet amidst the pain, there were positive developments. On August 14, 2018, the series Sharon La Hechichera premiered. It depicted how the singer broke through the conservative patterns of the Ecuadorian music industry, which had been male-dominated until then. The series also highlighted her journey to achieve her dreams, despite her economic status and the gender violence she suffered at the hands of Giovanni. The series was well received and raised awareness among a large part of society. However, bad news returned. On September 30th, 2019, the first court of penal guarantees of the province of Santa Elena issued a dismissal for the nurses at Gregorio Panchana Hospital. It could not be determined whether they were the ones who took the circulating photographs. Nearly five years after the crime, Sharon could not rest in peace. Today, Giovanni continues to serve his sentence at the Social Rehabilitation Center in Rio Bamba. He insists that Sharon's death was the result of a traffic accident, not femicide. According to a study, 
six out of ten Ecuadorian women have experienced some form of gender violence, and one in four has suffered intimate violence. What happened to Sharon was not an isolated incident. It is hoped that given her fame, her case will set a precedent that such crimes will not go unpunished. Thank you for taking the time to learn about another case from this channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, I warmly invite you to do so and join our great community.